Welcome to season two, episode 12 of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. I would personally like to thank each one of you for joining us today and for taking that first step to grow personally and professionally. For those who have a camera, I encourage you to turn it on and be present and to listen intently. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program has three main pillars. One, we develop students to create their own ventures, the traditional view of entrepreneur, to create those businesses and to scale them. Two, the second pillar, we encourage students to become corporate innovators or corporate entrepreneurs, those who develop new product services and ideas even within a firm. And we buy their products and we utilize their business models and their companies and, and services. And we can think of Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, to, to name a few. And I have more than a dozen students who are working at these firms. And lastly, arguably the most important and third main pillar, we empower students to define careers they define themselves and not what others define for them. To create that journey, to create that life, to create that career that may not even be invented yet. And to imagine a future and a, a life that they want on their own terms. And our next guest is providing resources and know-how on how to do these. Our next guest is someone who's at this intersection of the future and at the past at the same time. Her career as, a, as an archeologist and a digi digital heritage expert has allowed her to manage projects throughout US and Europe. Her work and expertise is testimony of how technology and advancements and in innovation help reshape the way we understand and engage and learn about our history. Our next guest will be sharing her experiences with emerging technology and learn about how it recreates these historical sites, enabling digital storytelling and projects and utilizing even augmented reality to help us experience art locally and in unique ways. So please give a warm welcome to assistant research professor and Access 3D Lab Director, Dr. Laura Harrison. And we do this with our mics off as a form of um, <laughs> sign language. So welcome, Dr. Harrison. Welcome and thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you and can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Thank you so much for that lovely welcome. Um, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. So what I'm working on nowadays is both a combination of my work as an archaeologist and an anthropologist, as well as my work directing and working in the field of digital heritage as the director of Access 3D Lab here at USF. Um, and so that takes a lot of different forms. On the one hand, it really involves collaborative conversations with faculty across the university. So, you know, I go, I reach out to faculty in history, anthropology, education, um, communications, et cetera, having these open-ended conversations about how do you think digital technologies might help you achieve what it is that you're trying to achieve or build new knowledge, cross new boundaries, et cetera, really innovate. And then we kind of develop, um, you know, those conversations are steered in relation to the assets and equipment that we have at my lab, which is really a fantastic range, um, sorry, a fantastic range of virtualization equipment. Um, that includes laser scanners, structured light scanners, and photogrammetry setups that are capable of virtualizing anything from the scale of about a coin all the way up through a landscape. And so you can see there's tons of potential manifestations of engaging with these multiple different departments, also students and community groups, asking them how might we be of service to you in innovating, um, creating new knowledge. Um, so that's one piece of what I do sort of day to day. The other piece, of course, is carrying out my own independent research projects and collaborative research projects, many of which pertain to the study of the human past and the study of human culture today. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit more in detail about some projects to give you an idea of exactly how we've utilized digital storytelling, digital mapping, virtualization in order to tell the many stories of the human past, not only to other fellow academics, but also to public audiences and global audiences. Fascinating. And I know that you have very unique and specialized technology. Maybe you could share a bit or uh, I don't know if there's a way of of, um, of showing what these highly sophisticated technology does or or 
virtualization and visualization, because we do talk that, about that a lot in all our courses, particularly our creativity and innovation course, where we see that making the complex simple helps us communicate ideas or the scalability or even our design thinking, where there's a whole method and, and step that's dedicated to virtualization. So that's very much ties into what your technology has been doing. So maybe you could share a bit more about the technology and. Of course, yeah, yeah. So. Um, if you'd like, I can just share my screen really quickly. Please. I think in discussions about virtualization, it always helps to have some visuals um, to sort of back it up. Um, the first thing I actually want to do is just show you my lab itself. And so here is a 3D scan of the space. This is on the Tampa campus. And if you come in here, um, you can actually see this is our large room. This is the open concept work area. And what we have here are things such as the touch table, which allow you to visually um, interact with 3D scanned objects. And then we also have here a couple of laser scanners. These are really kind of our marquee scanners. They're amazing for documenting biological collections or what we call close range scanning, so the smaller objects. And then we also have over here uh, what's called a photogrammetry setup. And that means that you take a lot of photos of something and then you stitch them together and that'll create a 3D model. Um, so basically what we're seeing here is this is our lab space. We do lots of teaching, um, education. This is open to all USF students. I just want to give you a kind of visual context for the type of space that we're working in. We also have other scanners that are more for outdoor spaces, so you don't really see them in here in the lab. They're locked away, but um, I'll show you some examples of those as well. So that's just a little visual context there, and now I'm going to go ahead and share with you a short presentation that I've made um, that'll just kind of walk you through some of um, some of the assets at my lab as well as some of the research that we do. Does that sound good, Dr. Diazio? Okay. Yes, wonderful. Okay, great. So I'll hop right in here. So the mission of the lab itself is to leverage cutting edge 3D technologies to support digitally driven research in STEM disciplines, the arts and the humanities. And you can see a couple of examples of our scanners working there, um, documenting, virtualizing some objects that we've uh, worked with the art department to create digital collections of. Um, so our activities really fall into four main categories. Um, the first being digitally driven research. That's probably really the core of what we do here. So um, that's what I described earlier, where we try to, you know, propel groundbreaking research across multiple disciplines, ranging from computer science to history and everything in between. Um, that also engages um, with these concepts of teaching. So we offer courses and workshops throughout the year. We're really big on hands-on training and methods of 3D scanning. And that works right into our certification program, which we developed in consultation with career services here at USF. We offer a badging program that authenticates your applied technology skills. Um, so what you do is you go through a several month training process. Um, you, com you complete an independent project. And as a result of that, you get a badge that's issued through career services. And that's something that you can put on your LinkedIn profile. You can use it in your job applications, your resumes. As a way to really say, I know how to do problem solving. I know how to work with technology. I know how to work independently and also as part of a team. I know also how to operate in an office environment, which is what we have here at the lab. Um, so that's something we're really proud of, and that's something that is open to all USF students free of charge. Um, in addition, we also do have some workshops which sometimes carry a fee. And those will be on site workshops that are more intensive, usually two to three weeks on site. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll find a local historic landmark or environmental um, place such as um, a threatened landscape, for instance. And we'll use that as a site to really bring all these ideas together of how do we work with you know, public organizations, stakeholders, technology and research all together. You can get um, some workshop credits for that as well. And then finally, a really important part of what we do here is creating partnerships, and I'll give you some examples of that later on in the presentation. But what we really do is not only work with USF faculty and students, but also with nonprofit groups, associations, museums, et cetera, groups in Tampa that want to utilize digital technologies to help them achieve their mission, reach new audiences, protect museum collections, you name it. So that's kind of our day to day. 
Um, in terms of technology, we are really well equipped here at USF Access 3D Lab. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of really, really high end scientific equipment. Um, so that really puts us in an echelon where not many other universities can really compete. We're really fortunate to have these assets here. Um, on the left there, you see structured light scanners. These are really popular in the museum field. Uh, the reason for that is they're very lightweight and portable. A lot of times museum collections are distributed at multiple locations or you need to travel to a museum across the country, for instance, um, to capture that. And the idea here is that these scanners capture both the shape of an object as well as its color at the same time. So that's, of course, really important if you're looking at, you know, a painted Greek pot or something where you really have to understand the painting to understand and appreciate the significance of that particular object. So once we create these 3D models, they can be brought into virtual worlds. They can be brought into digital museums. They can be also um, brought into digital collections. So that can increase the accessibility for researchers who want to do comparative research. It's also a way of democratizing knowledge because now you don't have to have the funding and the time to travel all around the world studying these collections that might be in different places, you can now just use the internet to do all kinds of object-based research. So those are really great scanners for that type of activity. In the center here, you see our laser scanners. These are kind of our big ticket items. And we've got the Ferro Arm, which I mentioned before, is amazing for close range scanning. And then on the bottom center, we have something called a terrestrial laser scanner or a terrestrial LIDAR. Sometimes these are also attached to UAVs or drones. That would be aerial LIDAR. Um, we have some terrestrial units here. Those are used for mapping landscapes and so we and also documenting architecture. I'll give you some examples of what that looks like, uh, but those are super high end. They're also used by police for forensics and crime scene analysis. Um, gone are the days of chalk outlines at crime scenes. Now they use these terrestrial laser scanners to create 3D images of entire rooms, entire crime scenes. They're also used at car accidents for the same reason to get that 3D data set. So really excited to have those. And then finally, rounding it out, we have our photogrammetry and 360 imagery section. Um, so we utilize drones to carry out a process called photogrammetry, which is when you stitch together multiple photos using software. And the algorithm in that software can actually generate three-dimensional geometry simply from the overlap of pixels in photographs. So you can get huge landscapes, multiple acres in size, those can also be geo-referenced to known control points in maps, so they can be survey grade products. Um, and that's a process and a workflow that can also be replicated at a closer scale or close range with just a handheld camera or a camera on a tripod in the lab. And then finally, we also have the Matterport model, which is kind of a consumer grade option. Um, it's what I just showed you for our tour of the lab space itself. It's used often in real estate, but it's great for creating virtualizations, virtual tours of all kinds of different buildings and landscapes, primarily interior spaces. Um, one of the neat things about the photogrammetry is it's a relatively low barrier to entry. So it's relatively inexpensive. You can buy your camera. You can actually start creating 3D models with something as simple as a cell phone or an iPad. Um, so that's great considering that our laser scanners and structured light scanners start at about $25,000 and they go all the way up to over $100,000. Um, and so we've got kind of a full range of, you know, these lower barrier to entry as well as these really high end scientific products here at the lab. I just wanted to say a word about um, kind of why some of these scanners do cost as much as they do. The reason is the accuracy. So there's lots of scientific applications where accuracy is absolutely critical to creating understanding. Um, most of our scanners work in the range of about 40 to 50 microns, which is about a little thinner than um, the width of one human hair. Um, so you can imagine if you were to scan an object with that level of resolution, and then you could really zoom in and see details that are almost invisible to the naked eye. Um, and so this is something that's really, really useful. You can start detecting fingerprints on pots, opens up all kinds of possibilities when you um, are able to acquire that level of resolution. Um, so just to sort of illustrate some of the ways that these, um, these um, assets are useful in research, I wanted to give you two examples of current research projects that we have here at the lab. And the first one I will start out with 
is our project at Egmont Key. Um, so Egmont Key is a Florida State Park and also a national wildlife refuge here in Florida. It's not too far from Fort DeSoto near St. Petersburg. And it's a little tiny island about two square kilometers that's located right where the Gulf of Mexico meets Tampa Bay. And so for that reason, it's really been important throughout history as a way to defend Tampa Bay um, from external threats. And we'll also see it was used for as a place to also incarcerate members of the Seminole tribe as well, sort of like Tampa's own Alcatraz. We're using these digital technologies as a way to engage with disaster preparedness, conservation of these historic sites, as well as a way to tell the stories, these historic stories of this island. Now, one of the most critical things about Egmont Key is it's highly endangered. As you can see, if we um, we see just one meter of sea level rise, obviously the coast of Florida will change dramatically and it will affect tens of thousands of heritage sites and historic sites and archaeological sites. And so the research project I'm working here with my colleagues is really trying to figure out how we can use digital technologies as a way to better prepare for this eventual um, sea level rise and also as a way to sort of tell the many stories of this site in case it does completely disappear. Um, so there's a lot of objectives of the project. First, we want to create an accurate 3D record of the heritage sites that are threatened by anthropogenic or human caused as well as natural caused events. So you can see in the map on the left there is just, um, these aren't even all the historic sites on Egmont Key. There's many more, but you can see it's really jam packed. This tiny little island has been so important throughout history. It's currently under a great existential threat due to sea level rise and also coastal erosion. You wanna figure out ways that we can record these sites before they're lost forever. Um, in addition, we want to collaborate with our community partners to promote preservation and education. So there's lots of groups that are out there. It's um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Florida State Parks, the Coast Guard is out there, and then there's community groups such as the Egmont Key Alliance. We work with all of those entities kind of finding ways to use visual virtualization in a way that benefits not only the research aspect, which I'm interested in, but also their bottom line and their mission organization and their goals. Uh, in addition, we want to engage with the public, both residents and visitors with digital technologies. So how can we reach new audiences with these digital products? How can we build sustainable tourism infrastructure on the island? And finally, we really want to communicate multivocal histories. Um, so that, enc that encompasses this idea that if all histories are not included, it's not US history or us history. And so I'll get a little bit more into that later, but there are some sort of invisible histories that are on this island. There's not a lot of interpretation right now in terms of signage and public outreach. Many people go to Egmont Key and they just have no idea about the amazing history and heritage here. So again, we're trying to use these digital technologies as a way to sort of help communicate that big message. Um, so as I mentioned, the island is really facing an existential threat. On the right hand side, you can see we've lost about 50% of the land mass in the last 150 years or so, um, and that process is accelerating. The image on the left is the 360 um, camera shot of the western shore of Egmont Key, which is where most of that erosion is happening. And you can see that shelf of sand that is not natural. I mean, it's not natural, sorry. It's natural, but it is evidence of this severe erosion. And you can see that gray concrete structure that's popping out. That's the back of a historic structure from the Spanish-American War. It's something called a gun battery. There's already two gun batteries that are fully submerged at Egmont Key. They're completely underwater. They used to be on dry land. It does appear that this one is next. So the first thing we can do is document this site. And then the next thing we can do is work with engineers, work with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Egmont Key Alliance, Florida State Parks, to come up with a way to hopefully prevent the erosion so that we're able to save some of these historic landmarks. Um, so this project is carried out as part of a workshop and also a course that's run through my lab. The course is called Applied Heritage and Sustainability Research, and we've been running it since 2018. Um, if you're interested in participating in this project, it's also going to be run as a workshop this summer um, in May for three weeks. And so you can, I'll give you some more information about that, but you can always reach out um, if you have further questions. That's the group from 20, 
2019. Obviously, we didn't run it last year because of COVID. And the methods that we work and we teach all the students is archival research, working with oral histories, terrestrial LIDAR or terrestrial laser scanning, which I described earlier, aerial photogrammetry, and virtual reality. So you get training in all of those aspects. Um, so the, the main method that um, we do use at Eggmont Key is called terrestrial laser scanning, and it's a time of flight laser scanner that basically sends out a laser from the scanner. And then as you can see in the image on the right, that image um, or that laser beam will intersect a surface of an object, such as a tower, take a measurement, and then return to the scanner. And each one of those points is recorded as a three-dimensional measurement. And so this is what the finished product looks like. This is a 3D fly through of the lighthouse at Egmont Key. This lighthouse is not open to the public. So this is a place where, or this is a way that we can use digital technologies to sort of bring the island to the people. We are incorporating this scan into public outreach activities, including um, a public touchscreen exhibit, as well as a virtual reality tour. And so that will give people a way who maybe they can't go to the island. Maybe um, there's a barrier to entry. They have to take a ferry to get there. It's the $30 ferry. Not everybody has $30 to spend on that. And also a full day on an island that has absolutely no infrastructure. It's got no running water. It's got no restroom facilities, no food. So it's pretty rugged, especially as you get into those summer months to really tolerate that type of day. Not everybody can do that. And so what we have here is an, a way to sort of offer a virtual tourism experience with a headset that's immersive, gives people the experience of going into this lighthouse, which is not even open to the public, even if you can manage to get to the island. And so we're using this as a basis to tell some of the many stories of the island to the public. This is the lighthouse that was built in 1858. Um, and so it's a really amazing historic landmark. It's one of the only lighthouses in West Central Florida. We just want to share this information with as much people, as many people and communities as we can. Another reason um, that we are really interested in utilizing these terrestrial laser scanners at the site is that it helps us with heritage monitoring. So the images that you can see here um, are generated, they're three dimensional point clouds that consist of millions and millions of measurements, which are about accurate to plus or minus two millimeters. So super, super accurate survey grade type of product and they've been colorized here that shows on um, the different depth values of these 3d data sets um, so we have this great baseline now of some, a structure called battery charles mellon which is an artillery battery from the spanish american war used to defend tampa bay against the external threat of invading spaniards who actually never came but that's okay um, the gun battery was in operation for about 20 years anyway and now, you know, if a hurricane comes through and damages Egmont Key, it's so susceptible to damage from storms. Um, the highest point on the island is just six feet above sea level. So what we could do is go back and scan the site again and then compare these RGB valued images to one another to really pinpoint exact areas where there was damage to the structure and then work with architects, engineers and conservators to retrofit the building, to strengthen it, to preserve and protect it. So we can utilize these 3D data sets not only to communicate to the public, but also to really develop data-driven conserva conservation and management plans. This is another example of that terrestrial LIDAR data set. It's something called a three-dimensional point cloud. You might be able to see these many different dots on your screen, these points. Each one of those is a measurement that was taken from the scanner and then it was colorized with a 70 megapixel camera that's built in. And this is where we get our really high resolution data from. So our scanners collect about 976,000 points per second. And we go out there and scan for about a week with two scanners. So we're really talking about hundreds of millions of points over the scan, um, span of a couple of weeks. And each one of those points is really holding the key to our future plans to communicate the heritage and also to preserve it in the future. Um, one of the big stories that we're trying to communicate and we're working directly with the Seminole tribe on is the story of Polly Parker. So as I mentioned, um, there was a time between 1856 and 1858 when the U.S. Army was coming through Florida as part of Indian removal and they were doing their best to round up all members of uh, all Native Americans and ship them out west to Oklahoma. Um, 
in Florida that took the form of a fort, that, an incarceration camp that was actually built on Egmont Key, in which Seminoles were held against their will from 1856 to 1858. And this is a story that's really not visible to the public at all if you go out and visit the island today. This is something that's just simply not communicated. And so we're working directly with the tribe. They would really like more people to know about this as a way to sort of figure out how to use digital technologies to help kind of bring the story to new audiences. One of the most amazing parts of the story is the woman that you see pictured on the left of your screen. Her name is Polly Parker. Of course, that's not her original indigenous name that was given to her by later historians. She was on the last boat out of Egmont Key. So that boat was headed to New Orleans, and but it made a stop in St. Mark's. And she managed to get off the boat in St. Mark's, as you see in the image on the right, um, telling the boat captain that she was going to collect medicinal plants. So she got off the boat and she managed to escape and make her way on foot all the way back down to the Seminole homeland south of Lake Okeechobee, which is where the current reservation is today. Um, she was with between six and 15 other people. Historical counts vary. What's really amazing about this story is first, just the bravery that would have been required to make it through such a landscape on foot at a time when the US Army was actively trying to remove all Native Americans. But also the fact that through her daughters and her lineage, now 25% of today's 4,000 members of the Seminole tribe can trace their ancestry directly back to Polly Parker. Therefore, Egmont Key is a really critical part of today's identity surrounding uh, uh, today's Seminole identity. And there's actually organized groups of Seminole descendants. These are all people who are descended from Polly Parker who've gone back to Egmont Key. You can see them right in front of that lighthouse that we just looked at the scan of. And this is a way for them to really kind of understand that past and have it resonate into the future. So it's really, really important for us to begin working with the oral histories or the recorded voices of these people as they speak to the experience of being descended from someone that was held against their will on Egmont Key. And so this is something that um, we're working directly with the Seminole Tribal Historic Preservation Office on this piece of the story. And one of the things that we're doing is incorporating digital scans of the area in which they were held. There's no surviving architecture, but we do have oral histories of people who said what it looks like, what we can do is digitally reconstruct that and then bring in audio files of Seminoles actually talking about what it means to them to be descended from Polly Parker. And so one of the applications is this touch screen that you see here, and we're bringing that, popping it up at various museums and cultural locations throughout Tampa Bay. And then another way we're doing that is bring it into virtual reality as well. So you'll be able to hear those stories and basically bring the island and bring the stories to you. And we're anticipating that will also go to places like schools, museums, cultural centers and the like. Um, so that's sort of the first project I wanted to talk to you about. And then I just have one more that I would like to highlight. This is a project that's completely different, um, but there's still some sort of underlying um, commonalities that run through both of them. This is Paint the Town, a journey inside Clearwater's murals with mixed reality. Now, this is a project that is collaborative with our client, the Downtown Clearwater Community Redevelopment Agency. And the Clearwater CRA is an organization that really wants to sort of put Clearwater on the map, redefine it as a destination for arts and technology. Um, so it kind of competes um, with Tampa and with St. Pete, but it, you know the CRA feels like they sort of need to get on the level of Tampa and St. Pete. And one of the ways that they're attempting to do that is by creating an augmented reality tour of one of the big landmark murals that they have right in downtown. And so, um, the project objectives are to set the bar for tech engaged public humanities programming, bringing murals and their stories to life with augmented reality, helping users locate and navigate the many colorful mur murals in downtown Clearwater, and also surprise and delight audiences by inviting them to experience art in a fresh new way. So you can see here a couple of the murals in downtown Clearwater. And what we're basically trying to do here is use augmented reality, which is where you take your own device, such as a phone or an iPad, and you point it at a mural and it will actually come to life. 
and it'll create sort of interactive hotspots that you can touch and you can hear stories. The mural will move, it will dance, it will come to life. And this is something that needs to be done on foot. It actually brings foot traffic to the physical location of the mural itself. And that's a way to kind of engage a little bit more with the local community, the pedestrian community, which is a big focus of what the CRA wants to do. You can see in the image on the right there also our terrestrial laser scanner was used to create sort of the backdrop for this whole exhibit, um, which is a 3D scan of the mural itself. We have our scanner up on the hydraulic lift there to get really good shots of the upper levels of the mural. So a big piece of how we actually carry out this idea is through storyboarding. And so we've worked with the folks over at USF's Advanced Visualization Center who do the AR development and VR development to sort of create a way to use that backdrop of the 3D scan and that goal of storytelling and public art engagement to figure out how to design an app and sort of what pathways through the app will look like and where the hotspots will be and what type of interactivity we wanted to create. Um, so here's just a couple of screenshots of the app that's going to be published in the Apple um, App Store as well as the Android Store within the next week or so. Um, and so that's something that you can even go out and test and experience for yourself. The app has all the information about where the murals are located, so it'll help you get there um, and you can start the experience, learn more about the murals. We're also going to be hopefully developing this in the future with the Clearwater CRA into an actual mobile walking tour of the murals that takes you through all four of the major downtown Clearwater murals and it'll actually have navigation built in so you can interact with one mural as it comes to life and then continue on to future destinations. Um, so here's just an example, again, another one of the screenshots from the app. In the background, you can see one of the hotspots. That's what it looks like, that sort of yellow, um, yellow sort of paintbrush looking thing. And then we've got the women in this mural kind of coming to life and they're they're dancing in the mural. And so once you touch that hot spot, they actually start to dance on your phone, superimposed over the mural itself. Here's another um, one of the hot spots that triggers a video. So you learn more about the artist creating the mural. And then this is also um, Another hotspot that shows you the other murals in Clearwater with some information on them as well that kind of comes up against this fun backdrop of paint splatters. And there's also sort of a biographical story about the artists who created um, this mural who are from Uruguay. So that kind of wraps up just a really quick brief overview of some of the technology we have in the lab and also what some of the projects actually look like. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen, but I'd love to, you know, carry it on with questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. You, to unpack just a few things, we can see this technology, this 3D and scanning technology is able to help recreate the past that we're losing and, and to tell different stories that way. We learn through the murals as more of a contemporary tourist way to generate um, uh, awareness about what's happened locally, but also um, uh, to possibly have some economic impact as a result. And then you also mentioned this idea of disaster preparedness. And I want to go a little off script because I know many of us follow what's happening in the news. And this past weekend, the governor, Governor DeSantis mentioned, and there's, there's been a lot of attention in the news, the idea of this uh, water pond that might or may not be toxic or may or may not be clean or may or may not be pumped in the in the bay or wherever we don't know but the point is is there an overlap or how could that technology help the government understand what is exactly happening because it seems to be a big area it seems to be sometimes we know some information sometimes we don't we're misinformation how could that technology or can it be applied to help us be more informed to help address this oncoming disaster or divert this disaster? Maybe you have some insight? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the first step to disaster preparedness is usually starts with a map or some kind of visual plan, right? And so I'm sure that that disaster site um, with that toxic pond um, would be a great place to, you know, fly a drone over that and just create a full map of that landscape 
in order to start planning, I have no idea how they're going to fix it. I don't know what the correct solution is there, but I do think that you could absolutely use virtualization technologies as a way to create a three dimensional high resolution survey grade map of the area of interest and then use that to start coming up with a plan of how to divert um, that toxic water in a safe way, in a manageable way, and hopefully also a sustainable way. How fast do you think that could happen? Because I'm not hearing solutions. I'm hearing, let's just pump it in the bay and just give approval for that. But you are providing, saying we have the technology, we can help provide more inclusive and, and better data, better knowledge. What could USF do? What could your lab do right now to help DeSantis, to help the community say, let's come up with a better solution than just, I don't know what's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, we could definitely, I mean, that type of scan project, if it were done from a drone, could be done in a matter of hours. Um, drone batteries only last 20 minutes, but we have eight batteries. So what you do is you just come up with a flight plan, which is typically a grid, and then you just fly that grid. It basically done automatically through the software on the drone. And the only complicated thing is you have to land it every 15 minutes to swap out a battery and then fly back up again and continue on with the grid. We use software here at the lab. We've got three different softwares that can stitch it together. So we've got Pix4D, uh, Metashape, and Reality Capture. So those can all geo-reference that data set, which means tying it into known geographical markers, latitude and longitude. Once you have that, then you can start working with engineers to come up with a solution uh, based on real data sets. So you're not just drawing a sketch on a cocktail napkin. You really have that full scale mapped grade, survey grade, um, data set that you can use to, you know, really develop engineering level plans on top of. Not to put you on the spot, but do you think the governor and, and the state is actually using this technology to make informed decisions or are they using more of the napkin? I think they probably are. Um, it's pretty standard that, you know, the government has gotten very involved in drone deployment, drone research, and they're pretty low cost. So I imagine that they're probably already doing it. Um, but, you know, if anybody <laughs> wants us to fly that area, we could certainly do it in a day as well and process that data probably within a couple days. So it's actually pretty quick. It's pretty efficient. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. But you can see how what is in, I don't know if they use the word, oncoming crisis or emergency. And do we really want polluted or toxic water in our bay? I don't know. I don't probably not. But you could see how this technology could be used in this third way that uh, Dr. Harrison has shared in terms of addressing disaster, and we can see that it's imminent. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I want to make some other connections. You know, sure. each of my classes, the students deal with variations of learning to prototype, to learning to make the complex simple, to use visualization. Certainly in our creativity, activity and innovation class, we do some basic sketches or we do some basic connections and pictures. In our scalability, they're expected to do some low res prototyping. And we, we talk about testing the market. We, we can easily see, and those are also interested in sustainability because they have a sustainability challenge that they're, they're trying to solve for. So much of the examples that you gave are really relevant to that. And we could see how this virtualization could help create some sort of better pitch or better visualization for those investors you're looking or to get people on board with your idea to help them create some sort of game plan going forward. So they're not, kind of left to their own devices to understand what you're saying, but you're saying let's motivate them through this 3D application, through this virtualization. And then of course, you talked about storyboarding and high levels of, of virtualization, which is what we teach in the design thinking class, which is a, the student consulting. So what, you, you're, the, the, what you're sharing is, is noise to my ears or, or music to my ears, excuse me. And I appreciate that. Um, thank you for sharing that about the Clearwater murals as well. Many of you probably see what's going on in Tampa and seeing what's going on. We can easily see that this can be a business that you can pitch to the, the Chamber of Commerce, the city, and recreate things, drive traffic, drive revenue growth. These are businesses that are ripe to be undertaken, and, uh, and you have the access to the technology. So... Mm -hmm. um, We've talked a lot about what's cool about technology. We, we're in awe with the technology that we have access to. But what is unsexy about technology that you work with? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question um, because, of course, it's really easy to get wrapped up in sort of like these beautiful visualizations, these great mapping products. But one of the examples I love to sort of draw in in this conversation is you need to create simplicity as much as possible in your life, especially when you work with digital technology, because it can sort of spiral out of control. Um, so I guess, you know, in a way, like one of the unsexy things that we do is working with like a photogrammetry setup and there there's a couple different ways that you can put them together so that's basically you're taking using a camera taking multiple overlapping pictures you're stitching them together with a software creating a 3d model so we used to have this fully automated system so it's basically a more complex way to carry out that same workflow where you've got three cameras rigged up to one tripod and that's all hooked up to a turntable that utilizes a computer to run. All the lighting is also integrated. So you would think, oh, well, this is going to be a turnkey solution because it's got every possible sort of input. It's all rigged together into one big master plan all running on a software. But in my experience, I actually find that it works better if you sort of distribute each one of those components and have them operating independently. So now we sort of broke down that setup. I have one camera on one tripod. I've got two lights that are independent of everything. They just have an on off switch. I've got a turntable that just has an on off switch, but doesn't require software to run. And so by sort of disentangling and distributing um, a technological solution, I find that you're able to kind of tinker with it a little bit more and it actually just makes it, it saves so much time in the end because trying to troubleshoot this like whole web of interconnected pieces that seems like it should be turnkey just actually ends up, it's just too much. It's like trying to hook up 10 Bluetooth connections at once or something, it's just way too much. And so in a way, I guess that's, sort of a retrograde solution where maybe you're not adopting the latest technology just for the sake of it. It's a little bit moving back to the days of everything being on its own, but we just get quicker results that way. And so I think part of it is, you know, there are so many ways to overcomplicate your life. And sometimes you do need to just take a step back and ask yourself, is it necessary to engage in this? You know, is, am I just chasing technology for the sake of technology? Or is there an actual reason why I need to overcomplicate this? This very much relates to some of our concepts and modules in our classes, particularly when we highlight the importance of even low res technology or low res solutions or low res prototyping. Mm -hmm. So what Dr. Harrison is suggesting that we there may be a lot of value in not over engineering or not chasing the next beautiful shiny technology object. But in fact, if we are entrepreneurs and we want to test the market, maybe this low res is the, the most practical, most efficient, most cost effective way to get a similar understanding of our under what our users want, what our uh, mm -hmm. whatever we're trying to test in terms of the hypothesis or to do the basic needs that we need to, to have to make be met. And if that includes a wire framing, she showed that the wire framing that was happening with the app. I know my students do exactly that with their solutions that they're trying to go. They wireframe the if it's an app that they're developing or they come up with a storyboard. These are all tools that we learn in our class and we can see how important they are in transmitting story, transmitting and communicating uh, the complex, making it simple um, so we can whatever influence, get investors, get buy in, uh -huh. tell bigger stories, et cetera. So wonderful for that. Um, I would like to prime our audience because I know oftentimes we're quite shy. So I would like for you guys to premeditate and start thinking about what questions you have about uh, the technology or the lab or, or anything of the great work that Dr. Harrison and, and her team is doing. So I'm going to ask one or two more questions and then we're going to open the floor for, for questions from the audience. This idea of digital heritage might not be new or might be new to some of us. I mean, I'm a business guy, what do we know about the humanities? We just chase the greenback and these types of things. But what needs to be said about digital heritage that we who are not so humane or at least not trained to be so humane uh, may need to know or what needs to be said about digital heritage? That's a great question. Um, my answer is going to kind of dovetail a little bit on my answer to the last question. And I think what needs to be said is that technological fetishism is a little bit of a problem within the field. 
And so that's this idea of sort of chasing the next latest technology. And the reason is, you know, it's more efficient, it's faster. Um, it might create a high resolution model. And there's just like, you know, this huge, you know how it's just every time you get a new cell phone, two years later, there's a bigger, better one. We have that same problem in digital heritage. And also, you know, a lot of the people working in that field have a background like I do, which is anthropology, archaeology, geography, you know, geography, something along those lines. Um, we are not technology people per se. So we kind of get into this bottleneck at times where we are, you know, our skill set is kind of coming up against the fact that we aren't actually computer scientists. So we're not developers, we're not programmers, um, we don't have that background. So when we start chasing the new technology all the time, it's like we're trying to do something that's sort of A, beyond our skill level and B, probably not like what we should really be doing instead of chasing new technology so much is thoughtfully like choose something and stick with it a while and engage our own background with it. How does this work with anthropology? How does this work with archaeology? And actually, you know, develop sort of a more longitudinal and sustainable approach rather than every six months I just have to get the latest thing because honestly there are pe people better than you, trained better than you in other fields who are doing that work. And you should just let them do that work. And then you should think about your own background and how that kind of can translate into a digital universe. And then just like do your research, stay up to date with the technology, but don't chase like every single new technology that comes out. Be really intentional and sort of finding a, an, a thoughtful way to, I don't know, combine both resources in a longitudinal fashion that, because otherwise you just get kind of caught up in something that you're not really trained to do. Thank you for sharing that. And for those who are entrepreneurs and innovators in my class, we start hearing from what Dr. Harrison said is that technology is advancing. It's impacting her industry and a few other industries that we've talked about today. But these are all opportunities, opportunities to either exploit or make better connections or uh, relate to other contexts and create value from that, which is the essence of what entrepreneurship and innovation is. Finding that business model tied to uh, a small temporary organization known as a startup or or even a broader initiative or innovation. So thank you for that. Yeah. I'd like to open the floor for any questions that our audience might have. This is a wonderful time to dig in, learn more. I know this is a tapa, but uh, we have a lot of hungry students out there to pave their way. So Sienna, maybe you can direct us. Yeah, I think Ethan and Piero. Hi, Dr. Harrison. So you Hi. talked a little about what your lab does, but I was wondering, um, how did you figure out that you wanted to get into archaeology and oh. anthropology? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So honestly, I just wanted to, I loved traveling and I wanted to figure out a way that I could afford to travel on a scale that was maybe like really high. <laughs> so I wanted to spend months at a time overseas on digs. I wanted to see the world and I just couldn't really figure out how I was going to be able to do that unless I had a job that would allow me to do that and or possibly help financially cover that through research grants, through just basic job travel. Um, so that's kind of, it didn't really start with Indiana Jones like most people think. For me, it really just started with traveling. I just wanted to go places. Um, and so fortunately, I mean, I have been able to do that and that I still love to travel. I mean, obviously. So, yeah, that's kind of where it came from. Um, and I'll just sort of jump a little bit into how did I get from archaeology to digital heritage or digital archaeology? And the way that that all happened was I was living and working at a site in Turkey in 2014 through 17 or so. And um, at that site, it was located within an active coal mine. And so it was in a really rural industrial part of Turkey and it was an amazing Bronze Age site that's sort of like early cities, origins of civilizations time period. And I was just so fascinated at the story that this site had to tell, but it was never going to get told because there was coal mine going all around, trucks going around, like the air was black. It was really, really industrial and they were destroying this archeological site that was sitting on top of this coal mine. And I just started to think that it would be so sad to just sort of write like one academic paper about this and then have a couple people read it. And that's the end of the road for this amazing Bronze Age site. And I started to think, you know, I'm studying the architecture. Why not study it in 3D? And then it becomes so much more publicly accessible. 
um, as opposed to sort of a two-dimensional architectural drawing of some old crumbling building. When you can bring it back to life, all of a sudden, it just like opens up this whole world of public communication. And so that's kind of how I got into the world of digital heritage was I undertook that project and now I have my whole lab, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Harrison. Um, my question is about also uh, the, not the, heri the digital heritage. And basically, I'm from Peru, and there's oh. a lot of a lot of heritage. However, it's lost due to well, the Spaniards conquesting uh, Peru, and well, and nowadays we don't want to know anything about the Incas and all of that. And if you were here in Peru, what will be the place that you would like to rebuild or in, in Latin America or, or in the world per se? Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that question. I went to Peru in 2016, I think, and I um, absolutely loved it. I would love to go back. So yeah, the Nazca lines really come to mind and the, I didn't actually get to go to see the Nazca lines. I'm not sure if any all of you are familiar with them, but they are these geoglyphs that are built out in the desert in Peru. And um, they're really, the only way to really see them is from the air, as I understand. I mean, I think somebody drove a truck through one a few years ago and it was a whole disaster. So you really have to see them from the air. And um, it's hard to get to and it's also quite expensive. So there's that accessibility barrier. And I think if there were just even some aerial drone landscape shots done, um, some drone mapping of them, it would be a way that you could sort of virtually bring that site to others and also help preserve it because they're very delicate, even though you'll have these huge, you know, geoglyphs of monkeys and all kinds of animals that are hundreds of meters wide. They're also just really built from a collection of small stones that if you were to see them on ground level, they, they're kind of unremarkable and you would have no idea how this is a giant condor. And so that's why people have driven with their trucks over them and destroyed sections of them forever. And these are hundreds of years old, possibly even older. Um, so I think there's huge potential in terms of accessibility to maybe you know bring a site like that. Um, obviously preservation is one big reason, but accessibility would be another. Thank you. Yeah. I think Jim had a question and then Ethan. Thank you, uh, Dr. Diazio, for having this. This is great. Dr. Harrison this is like the neatest thing I've seen in a year. Um, and it's really <laughs> important, important work, I think, that you're doing. Um, I have a quick question. You know, we have something called the JBuilt Innovation Technology Challenge this month, um, where students can submit to win three, five, and ten thousand dollars for ideas for their businesses. And two, two of the five categories are um, supply, or I'm sorry, sustainability and global global stewardship, which certainly the first uh, project you talked about is, and then the other one is uh, you know AI and data analytics, that kind of thing. So if a if a student has an idea for a business and they'd like to use some of the equipment that costs up to a hundred thousand dollars, can you or even a faculty member, can you take me through the process? I'm sure they have to be trained. Is there insurance? What happens if they drop it? Um, does one of your staff have to come out and actually uh, administer it? What yes. is that process for a student where they could take something um, like this uh, and use it for a particular project for funding um, yeah. and get, get, use that great equipment and all of the resources that you have in your lab? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so we thank you so much for the question. Uh, we definitely assist with that. So we try to say yes more than no as much as possible. Um, what we'll often do if somebody has absolutely no training in the technology is we'll set up a consultation. So we'll ask, do a Q&A, what are you trying to achieve? And I can recommend this type, the type of scanner or virtualization that you would need to achieve that. Um, and then we can just offer the necessary training. So we do have a staff here at the lab. It's pretty small, but it's enough to get the job done. And um, so we'll just offer however much training is needed for that project to be carried out independently. And then we do a sign out thing. Um, we already have insurance through USF. And if you're bringing the equipment internationally, um, you usually have to take out a little bit of additional insurance and or um, do, depending on the country, there's some import export restrictions. Um, but for example, we had a Fulbright student here at USF who wanted to scan an archeological museum collection in Ecuador. And so what we did was we signed out one of our $25,000 scanners to her uh, through her Fulbright program at no cost to her. She was able to take it to Ecuador. And then we just did an MOU basically asking for credit on publications, presentations, um, some help with the public outreach side of that as well. But the way our lab is set up right now at USF is what's called a shared user facility, 
Um, and so that means that it is free of charge to faculty and students. Now our external groups, our external clients such as Clearwater, CRA, or some other clients, we have a landscape architect, for instance, we work with, we charge them to do projects that are just fully external. Um, but when it comes to USF research, we can offer that um, free of charge. Now that said, if you do have a grant or you do have some funding, a scholarship or something like that, we're certainly happy to, you know, be written into those grants and we encourage faculty to do that. Um, but if you don't have the funding, we don't want to prevent you from sort of working with the technology and that's how we're set up. We're basically funded through the USF um, Office of Research and Scholarship for that purpose. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Ethan. Yeah, sorry, I have another question. So earlier you mentioned the um, certification program that I think you said it took a few months. Um, where could we find more information about that? Um, you can either just like email me or go to our website for more information. But the basic deal is that um, you can either do like a shorter workshop, which will be, you know, nine to five type of schedule for a couple of weeks and get your certification in probably like three weeks or four weeks. Or you can spread it out across the semester and do an independent study or something like that, either for credit or not for credit, it's up to you. And what you'll do is sort of design a project in consultation with myself that pertains to whatever it is that you're hoping to do in your career. And then we can you know, give you the training that you need. And once you've done 25 hours or so of training and kept a journal on it, then you can embark on an independent project. And we'll be here if you have any questions. Those are in person only. We don't really do like virtual. It's too hard to do virtualization virtually. <laughs> um, so we do that all in person um, and we can just set up a schedule. Usually it's 10 to 15 hours per week for a semester and then you get your finished product. You usually create an e-portfolio and then once you're finished with that, we evaluate everything and you can get a badge. All right, thank you. Yep. And I also have a question. So as a future entrepreneur, I'm looking to go into environmental sustainability, and I love what you're doing with the Egmont Key project. So I would really like to be a part of it. And is this project available to all USF students? And how can um, and what exactly will will we be doing in this project? Awesome. Um, so the project is open to all USF students. It's also open to non USF students and just anybody from the public. Um, it's being run as a workshop this year. There is going to be an announcement sent out probably this week, so I can certainly send you that flyer when it's ready. I think the dates are May 10th through 17th ish. It's um two weeks or so, and it's going to be a great workshop. So it's going to be run by my colleague over at the College of Global Sustainability, Brooke Hansen. She's the director of sustainable tourism over there, and so she does kind of the whole sustainability piece of what we're doing there. So she'll be doing um, several different components of like multi-day workshops out at the island. I think it's going to be five days out at the island and then five days in the lab. Um, so there's going to be a couple of like sustainability days. There's also going to be a day with the Heritage Monitoring Scouts, which are this amazing group um, the Florida Public Archaeology Network has where they set up heritage monitoring stations at heritage sites throughout Florida. And what they do is basically encourage citizen scientists to take photographs at those locations when they're just, you know, being a tourist on Egmont Key, uploading them to a big photo database, and then that all gets archived by the state. And it's a way to basically participate as a citizen scientist in monitoring an endangered heritage site. So we're going to be setting up one of those stations and getting some information from the director of that program. And then I'll also be going out and leading some scanning as well for about two days. We're going to probably scan the lighthouse. Maybe not if we can't get to do the lighthouse, we'll do the guardhouse. Um, so those are really cool structures and you'll get some experience with the 3D virtualization aspect. Um, so yeah, it's going to be an awesome workshop. Um, it is $500, I think the last time I checked, but you do get, you know, a couple certifications and all that kind of stuff through it as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. If I could piggyback off of a lot of the questions that were made, think of it this way. It, you know, the, the the badges or the training that you can get with Dr. Harrison and her team can also be partnered with the projects you have in my class. So for instance, in the scalability and innovation course, uh, you have a semester long sustainability uh, uh, project that deals with Internet of Things, of smart cities, of urban uh, bottom-up innovations, et cetera. 
there is strong and lots of overlap with how that technology can be used at the same time overlap with the credit or time that you need in order to get certified. And the same thing for the student consulting and design thinking course where you have another challenge, but you're learning about vir uh, virtualization and concepting. So you can easily say, think of this on a resume, right? You go through these different experiences, you get badge, you take these courses, you have these projects. Now you start having a very robust uh, story on your resume to say, not only am I being taking these classes and learning the knowledge within them, but now I'm becoming an expert in concepting visualization. And it may be, you know, of course, you might not be an expert with the scanners or whatever, but when you're going to a company and you want to work as an innovation manager or in a, on an innovation team, or you want to work with design thinking and you want to work for companies like Pepsi, Johnson & Johnson, MBA, Orlando Magic, um, Target, all these other companies use design thinking, use visualization, use virtualization. And you're saying, I spent so many hours focusing on these and prototyping. That is a very powerful skill and story for you to tell these hiring managers and companies. And that will easily differentiate you from others who just took the class and don't see these broader connections. So there's ways of taking these experiences and these learning that complement what you're doing in the classroom and make a very powerful narrative of why you are an expert or why you are better prepared as a recent graduate in whatever field or company or job that you're, you're looking to, to, to move into. Do you not agree, Dr. Harrison? No, I mean, I think that's totally the whole, uh, that's kind of like the underlying principle of a lot of the stuff that we do here. Like it's not just, we want to train students to help us out in the lab. We really want to train students to go out there and succeed in the workforce. And so we, yeah, I mean, it's all kind of geared towards that idea of like enhancing your resume, improving your resume, giving you answers to interview questions, all that kind of stuff. So I absolutely agree. I mean, just imagine you telling a story how I was learning technology and the connection between the past of here in Florida and how to use technology to storytell. Guess what? Google, Facebook, Apple all focus on storytelling, mm -hmm. how innovation is tied to storytelling, how you're recreating that, how you're building raging fans and making the complex simple. This is what you're experiencing and have the opportunity to build on. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Just the last few questions before we wrap up, because this has been wonderful and it's around technology. And like I said, we talk a lot about technology. And I'm wanting to know maybe your opinions about emerging technology or predictions about technology in the future. I know you've talked about LIDAR. LIDAR, LIDAR, and LIDAR we, yeah. have, we have that in our phones and tablets and it'll become even more democratized. Where is that technology and other technology that you play with and, and you're expert in and, and where is that going and where should we spend our time uh, to become more aware? Yeah, so I definitely think one of the big trends that's going to emerge is more consumer grade technology. So like we have our $50,000 LiDAR scanners. Um, those are great. We scan the lighthouse with them. We scan these big sites, but now Apple released a version of LiDAR in the new iPad, iPad Pro. So it's basically a way to scan a building and it is through your iPad. So clearly it's not gonna be the same level of resolution as our $60,000 version here in the lab, but I just think in five years, 10 years, or even less possibly, you're gonna see sort of a democratization of that LiDAR technology into more consumer grade products rather than strictly at the research level. I think that's gonna be awesome. And I think that also goes for some of the software that we use as well. So for instance, We've got softwares like the AutoCAD suite where we've got, you know, um, AutoCAD, Revit, and Recap that are used by drafting engineers, architects to sort of 3D plan, 3D model, um, 3D draw various kinds of complex architectural buildings. But, so those are really complicated programs that takes a good degree of training to get familiar with. Um, but then on the other hand, we've got these more consumer grade products emerging like Google SketchUp. And Google SketchUp is actually a really affordable, inexpensive, simple, and easy to use solution that's used even by entities such as HGTV. If you ever watch one of their shows and you see the little drawings that they do of some renovation, those are done in SketchUp. 
And so you can see there's sort of a transition where, you know, we're always going to have those high end tools, but now some of these more consumer grade tools are even migrating into these high level spaces like an HGTV show. And so that's just a consumer grade product that you can have for, you know, $15 or something like that, put it on your computer, off you go. So I do think there's, you know, we're having this democratization even of the software. Like, so now to do an architectural drawing, you don't necessarily have to learn the AutoCAD suite. You can start playing around with that stuff in a really high level way with a more simple and easy to use solution. So I just think that's sort of the direction things will go probably in the future. Fascinating. So these are also skills for us to be on that trend, to be on that curve and to capitalize if we're, we're interested or if these things um, pique our interest. We have one last question uh, to ask our guests, and we ask all our guests this. So if you could go back and give yourself younger self advice, what would you say to her? Um, that's a tough question. I would probably say, you know, just stay optimistic. I think there are so many great things happening in the world of technology, and I think that if you approach like things that you don't know with a sense of optimism and curiosity, that there will be whole new worlds will open up to you. And I think that that's certainly been true over the last 10 years as my career has taken many twists and turns that I would have never imagined. I'm sure that'll continue to be true in the future as technology and innovation continue to accelerate. Dr. Harrison, this has been great. Thank you for spending the morning with us. I'll definitely circle back. If, there, if the students are interested in reaching out to you without knowing more about your lab, maybe you can give uh, the final plug and we're grateful for yeah. your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So one way to stay up to date with our current projects, workshops, all that is just following us on Facebook at Access 3D Lab. You can also send me an email at access3d at usf.edu or Harrison L at usf.edu. And we'd be happy to hear from all of you and work with all of you. So thank you. Thank you for spending the morning with us. I'll loop back and we'll catch up soon. And grateful for the time that you shared and, and all the wisdom and, and technology that we do have access to. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Nice to meet you all virtually. Thank you.